So our theme this year is Where Do I Stand? When we were looking to develop the theme, we were trying to find something that doesn't sort of pigeonhole the whole seminar, broad, but also has, can have some meaning. So it comes through, things we sort of thought it could be applied to was, where do I stand at this present time? Am I happy with where I am, with how things are going? How do I stand with adopting latest technology? Are we ready, are we managing it properly? How do I stand with my systems? Are they adequate? Are they compliant? Are they actually effective and safe? And are they leading practice? Also, considering the circumstances of incidents that have occurred at other mines, where do I stand with that hazard? Where am I exposed with that? And how are we managing that? I'd particularly like to thank some of our presenters here today and tomorrow who are presenting on incidents at their mines. I recognise that's not something easy to do to get up here, bear your soul and I guess share the issues that have occurred at your mine can be um, quite personal in that regard. So I do thank, particularly thank the speakers there. And I'd love to say next year that we tried to get people of that or to present on that sort of vein and we had no incidents that actually warranted that. So something to achieve for. And also as another reflection is where do I stand? Is it standing with the workers, seeing what's happening, knowing what's going on? Or do I stand sort of separate, silent, in the office tucked away? So just to run through the mechanical teams here, to split up into the different groups. Under our coal stream, there's Paul Drain, Greg Connolly and Dave Clarence. We've got in the uh, Medex and Petroleum, Bill Costello, John Parolin and Safraz. Under the Small Mines team led by Peter, there's Dwayne Jones. In the CAU team, there's Peter Sunnell. And then under the Mechanical team, there's myself, Ross Dutchbury and Jeremy O'Brien. So they're the people you've probably dealt with over the phone, emails, whatever, if you haven't met them, it's a good chance to actually put a face to the name, make yourself known, say day. So I thought I'd run through just a couple of things overall in general, some of our incident trends. So the first there we've got 2017, 2018, then 2019 year to date, and then just a pro rata projection. So you can see looking similar to last year. Um, when looking at these trends, certainly take them or don't take them on their raw figure, realising with change of legislation, additional clauses coming in as notifiables, um, general change in awareness. So while we do have all the stats and we do look at trending, we do actually try to stay aware of what is actually relevant, what it means to us and, and how it is. So going through there, we've got our monitoring events on the bottom, which are typically the ones we look at you don't hear from us. Uh, the next band's our, um, what we term, term a standard event. So that's one where it'll be sort of the emails back and forth, seeing what's been uploaded to the portal. Uh, the yellow on top is where we've had an inspector attend site and the final piece is um, others that have gone to high level investigations, be that um, just more detailed investigation uh, by our inspectors to causal investigations and finally to the major investigation unit. And just by comparison there, they're sort of the similar response level so we do have some variance between those. Looking through things that are relevant for mechanical this year, um, I wanted to review through the safety alerts and bulletins and I thought I'd try and apply that to our theme of where do I stand. So first up, do we have people standing in the line of fire? So we've got where a flight bar ejected um, while pulling chain onto a continuous miner. Then got workers hit by high pressure fluid. So we had, you can see there, I hope everyone has seen and reviewed this alert where we had a worker receive basically a fluid burn to the cheekbone on the face. So I'm sure everyone can appreciate that we're talking a very short distance there between a major injury or fatality and, and um, what the worker received. And also where we had a coupling disintegrate ejecting components where no one was immediately there um, in the line of fire, but there was certainly potential with how those components were ejected for distances. So where do we stand? We're using safe or unsafe equipment with metallic materials or non-metallic materials on trucks underground. Are the actual materials and components we're using adding to the fuel load and um, posing um, toxic combustion risks? Elevated workbox falling from a um, loader. 
So this may, may have been in a hard rock scenario, but certainly applies to the coal scenario with man boxes and LHDs. Once again, the brake coupling disintegrating. And then a second one we've released on the configuration of work baskets. And from some of those, I can see there's learnings from both sectors, from one to the other. And lastly, safety critical failures on road registered vehicles. So this was one that, um, one of the incidents I actually attended for the crane rollover. And one of the things that sort of struck me was looking at the timings, the fact I thought that crane's probably driven past my wife and kids while they were um, on the school running on the way to work, while that was driving around on the road in an unsafe state. So when you do have those road registered vehicles and finding issues, do think of the broader picture there for how it can apply and what the impacts can be. While it may not just apply to the mine site, and I guess your responsibility, just to the wider community. And finally, with work practices. So once again, the high pressure fluid release and also the um, welding or electric shocks that we saw through the start of the year. Um, so I just wanted to mention the couple of causal investigations we have ongoing at the moment that the mechanical team are involved in. The first up is the collision between a semi-autonomous dozer and a manned excavator. So that one's working through, will be finished in the next few weeks and we'll also have an animation um, created for that. So um, as you may have seen from the recent ones with the gas exceedance and also the nose to tail collision, um, I hope everyone's seen those videos. That's a direction we've started to take to try and help, help get the information out there to make it usable for the workforce. So it's intended as something to use in um, toolbox talks, pre-shifts, training days, along those veins, just to try and have something you can put in front of the workforce has impact rather than just another PDF document you print out, stick on the notice board and hope that people read. So I think that's a good direction we're going in. Um, also too, we're using coal services to actually create that, um, those animations. So I'm, I've, I've been impressed with the level of detail we've seen. So the gas exceedance, for example, just the, the fact they've got the actual right XAM tone, that's um, just the look of it. Even through the, um, the nose to tail collision, seeing the details of that and how that can be used. So, um, last week at the Minerals Council HSEC Awards and um, conference, they were set up there, put the VR helmet on, actually hands there, given the hand uh, controls, and you can actually stand there on a machine and watch that collision happen right in front of you. And I think that's, that's a good tool if we can use as the industry to help, help reinforce that and to sort of give the war stories a bit more, a bit more meaning and hope. Hopefully that, that helps get the message out. And another one underway is where um, the pin ejected while being lanced. So for that, the reason that was taken to a causal was just thinking about how often that task does happen. So some may say, well, it's a high, high frequency task, it's a fairly low occurrence, but it has happened. If we can make people aware and change work practices, it should result in a safer workplace overall. Uh, just a few other things I wanted to run through is where we are in 2019. So regarding diesel exhaust emissions. So we've finalised a discussion paper that um, will be released shortly um, in line of the fire on mobile plant style one um, seeking comment. So one of our key recommendations is supporting the 0.1 milligram per cube for an eight hour time weighted average um, in the workplace exposure standards. And that matches to the current levels in 29. Safe Work Australia, however, are currently advised they're doing a review on the workplace exposure standards. Um, we don't know what limit they're proposing. There hasn't been any engagement there. We're waiting to see what comes out, which is due in October. Um, so unknown for that. But as they've done recently with um, dust, there will be changes expected there. From our targeted assessment programs, we've seen a wide variety of um, management of that risk and the controls in place. So from some places having nothing at all in place through to mines that we see as sort of in the best practice realms and um, aspirations for other places to achieve. This will be, become an ongoing focus for us as, as with um, the other respirable dusts and there'll be more, more programs following on from the first round of targeted assessments. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, we had our fire on mobile plant discussion paper released 
Um, from that, we took all the feedback. There was quite a large volume of feedback received, so I thank those who did submit. That's what we need. If we don't get that, we don't know what industry wants and thinks, and it doesn't help. It then helps us shape to be a more realistic approach for where we are. So the key message from that was all fires are preventable. We're not mandating a, direct, a directive, as the feedback um, gave us from the um, proposals that were included there that they weren't, certainly weren't seen as silver, silver bullet to address the situation. But for different scenarios, each of those being fire resistant fluids and temperature, surface temperature controls do have a place and do need to be adequately considered, not just the um, token, yep, can't do it, cross it off the list. So as mentioned, we did take all that feedback and have, there were some major changes to that discussion paper. As I said, we do recognise the limits. As I said, they're not silver bullets with fire resistant fluid, but speaking with OEMs, they are available for certain situations and by all accounts aren't being used. So as we work through this process, there will be some changes in our response to fires when they are reported and, and what we do actually um, ask about controls and challenge. Another one being surface temperature controls are the key, but within that as well, we, don't, we certainly don't believe lagging is the, the solution to it. Uh, we do see a wide range of some quite effective lagging, but we do see a lot of ineffective lagging that does actually contribute to the causes of fires. So moving forward with our fires on mobile plant um, program, plant inspections for the coal, surface coal sector were all wrapped up last year and that's now moving into the underground metal space due to several large fires we've had in the last 12 to 18 months in that area and seeing, seeing the impacts of that with people in refuge chambers for eight hours sitting waiting to actually work out or to be recovered and assisted from the mine. So in one case we had yeah, someone in a refuge chamber by themselves for eight hours. Uh, comms were lost um, during that time. So you can imagine that sitting there for several hours by yourself, waiting, not hearing what's happening, not knowing whether you should be, you are still right to be there, whether you should, it's safe to leave, leaving that in doubt. We have commenced meeting with OEMs. So we're taking the fire data that you report to us through the ancillary forms and through the incident data and actually showing them. So presenting to them, here is the sort of total percentage. Here's your share of the pie of where you represent for fires on mobile plant in New South Wales mining. Um, actually has been good involvement and good feedback there. They're asking questions, wanting more detail, um, wanting to use that information within their companies. It's also been a good learning curve for us, finding out what OEMs are doing and what options they have. So as I mentioned before, finding out that there are fire resistant fluids available for some applications. Um, seeing where actual detailed CFD analysis is being done on designing fire suppression systems to be fitted to address um, the possible ignition points. Um, even looking CFD analysis into temperature controls and how the engine bay is actually operating from that side of things, so it's positive to see. And there is a planned workshop in the future to try and bring all that information together, get everyone involved from the people operating and owning the plant, maintainers, through to the suppliers and dealers, and also the fire suppression um, service providers as well, just to try and get everyone in the room who's, who has, I guess, skin in the game, have a good discussion on it, and um, work through with what we've found and where we think the industry should be headed to. But the key there is less fires overall. It's what we want to see. And I hope that all, all sites want to see that, but not from, might not be the safety case that all people want to see less, but be it from the production case. If that's a, the angle we need to use to, to sell the story, so be it to get the case across. Um, regarding fires on mobile plant and legislation, we do have a, um, some proposed changes coming in. So we're looking to add an additional clause around notification of fires on mobile plant. So I'll run through what the existing R and the new is to lay it out. So always remaining will be the 179B, which is any fire underground, be it mobile plant or not, where we then go to a dangerous incident where persons were at risk. 
and then back to our 128 for a high potential where persons could have been placed at risk. And the new one following on from there will be a high potential um, standalone being any fire on mobile plants. So this at the moment is proposed, so it is going through review and legal and approval. So I can't actually give any indication of when that'd be, but it's yeah, something we are pushing towards. The main driver for that is so we actually see the complete picture. So when we go and talk to OEMs, it's a case of this is all of the fires that have occurred, not a case of this is all the fires that we know about. And we have been finding that OEMs aren't aware of the actual magnitude of the incidents on their machines. So I think that is a positive that we're getting that message through and getting that buy-in. And in the end, the goal is to actually prevent fires, keep people safe and keep producing. Um, some other potential legislation updates we're proposing. With the increase in autonomy and um, remote vehicles under operation, there's an inclusion for the loss of control of that plant. Main reason around that is if you have an autonomous haul truck, autonomous loader working away, has a loss of comms, loss of control, and there's no one in the vicinity, no one in the area, if it's a complete separate circuit, we'd expect that that's something that probably wouldn't be reported because there's no person at risk or could have been at risk. But the reason we want to know about these is from a data point of view. If we've got, say over the next three years, 20 trucks running around on isolated circuits, but we're having loss of control events related to a particular plant, and then as we mature as an industry, we end up with blended operating areas. Suddenly you do have those people at risk, but we don't have that awareness of those loss of control events. So by finding that information out early, we can try and drive improvement and drive change to make sure when we do get to that case where we have manned and autonomous vehicles operating in close proximity together, that we actually have addressed the issues found. So um, I have no doubt that mines with those systems would be chasing their OEMs, but it's to give us the ability to see the bigger picture, see if it is particular, make, model, et cetera, that's having the issues, or if it's across the board in a wide variety, might be one here, two there, but gives us a total number and gives us a better chance of actually helping address that before we do get to the case where it is a major problem. As I mentioned previous, all fires on mobile plants um, notifiable. There is a proposal at the moment going through for discussion for item registrations on um, plant to be a five year um, validity. So that one's still undergoing. So once again, don't know when that'll come into effect or where that'll be. Um, some other general updates that we have underway within the team. So MDG 33, it's one that has been there for a while. Um, we have taken, or if you've gone looking, the previous multi-part drafts have been taken down. We're actually working through those at the moment with the industry feedback previously provided. Uh, there will be some restructuring of it, trying to make it, I guess, a bit more user-friendly and split it up into better sections and um, some sort of changes to contemporise it a bit and update to 2019. Um, MDG 25 is also another one having a refresh and review and 3608 as well. Um, as a side note as well, the fact sheets um, have been updated or the plant design registration for applicants sheet's been updated with trying to give some more info from the one that was released last year and just to try and clarify and improve that. Also too, we've just done a recent update in the last two weeks on the um, DES item rego form. So if you do have an old version of that, please grab the new one just to help the process through. And also our notification of other matters form. That one's been updated to include for um, when you have someone covering in one of the stat roles, now there's a tick box for whether they need access to the portal and whether that's for a fixed term or ongoing. So that's just to try and make sure when someone starts, they've got access from day one and saving to have to go through a second process to chase to get that access. So trying to make life easier for everyone and have the system flowing as it should. Um, for maintenance of competency, running through, so as everyone's probably aware, Coal Services have an app running for those in the metalliferous space. They've just developed that as a means of recording. Um, they've done that on their own and informed us along the way, so by no means is it an endorsement or ever. I believe there's some people who've had a few issues that 
have been addressed in the system since. Um, to assist in that, I have had QR codes created for the seminar, so last slide of the day will be the QR code to um, grab that and it'll load all of the speakers split up across the different categories straight into your logbook. So slide at last slide of the day, so if you want it to be two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, um, but we will also do the Excel log onto the website that's been there with the last couple of seminars as well for those who are running the separate sheet there, so just to try and assist. And that was all for me. Thank you very much.